thank you very much. That is a very generous introduction. Um, you know, I, I'm very honored and uh, touched to be here and speaking to you. Uh, there are probably, probably every one of you in this room could be up here and speaking to this group about what you're doing in healthcare. Uh, so I'm honored to, to share some of my thoughts, uh, some of my thoughts on it. Uh, not to embarrass to have a special guest, my daughter with me here, Serena. <laughs> who uh, we were able to do two birds with one stone and do a little college visiting here <laughs> while we came up to Hanover. So, um, so about 50 years ago, uh, on June 6, 1966, Robert F. Kennedy uh, gave a speech in South Africa. It was a national union of student, student activists. Uh, and he spoke about the struggle for equality. And he gave a, I want to read a quote from his speech. Quote, there is a Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times. And like it or not, we live in interesting times. There are times of danger and uncertainty, but they are also the most creative of any time in the history of mankind. And everyone here will ultimately be judged, will ultimately judge himself on the effort he has contributed to building a new society and the extent to which his ideals and goals have shaped this effort. So when I read that, you know, I brought to mind the moment we're in in healthcare right now. Um, I've been doing this work for, for many years, and I think we are really at this sort of a moment when there are sort of tectonic shifts happening in the U.S. healthcare system. And all of us, I think, have sort of front row seats, and maybe more than that, I think we're on the stage in trying to play a role in how we shape that. So I've had the privilege for the last 15 years uh, to lead a not so small now startup called Iora Health uh, that you just heard about, uh, which is actively trying to create a new vision of this new healthcare. Uh, what we're trying to do is start from scratch, build a new model from the ground up. Uh, and I think the core philosophy is that we have in US healthcare uh, been really focused on a transactional system. The system is built largely on fee-for-service, and I think too many of our institutions spend time focused on transactions and documenting and coding and billing and playing games with these transactions, uh, and that the system is geared toward doing more stuff to people, and not, which I think, the real thing we ought to be doing, which uh, is actually improving people's health and keeping them out of trouble, meaning out of hospitalizations and procedures they don't need. Um, in order to do that, though, I think a lot of what we're trying to do in U.S. healthcare is simply adding more things onto the current system, whether it's medical home criteria or ACO criteria or meaningful use. And I think one of the core, core things that we thought about in IR Health is maybe what we ought to do is actually take things away. One of my favorite quotes is from Michelangelo, the great sculptor, and they asked him, how do you get the pieta, this beautiful sculpture? And he said, it's really simple. I take a block of stone and I chip away everything that's not the pieta. Right? But that's what it is. Healthcare is beautiful. We've been doing it for thousands of years. And at core, it's very simple, but we've made it really complicated. And part of what we need to do to simplify. So what we did is we simply started over. We're building new primary care practices. I'll do a quick description uh, of what we're doing. Really, it's to start from scratch, build on the basis of relationship. We call it high-impact relationship-based primary care. Uh, we start with changing the payment model. Right, so I think we say fee-for-service is the wrong way to pay for primary care, so stop doing it. We work with progressive sponsors, we call them, um, whether it's employers like Dartmouth College or King Arthur Flower, two great local employers, uh, or uh, health plans. Uh, Humana, I know we have some friends from Humana here, United, Tufts Health Plan, uh, who we work with. Uh, we then build uh, robust teams of people whose job it is not see one patient at a time, but we have a population of people, they're our responsibility. How do we improve their health, keep them out of trouble, and do whatever it takes, right? So we do huddles every morning, everyone gets a personal health coach, we get shared care plans, we interact with people by email and text message and groups, we take them grocery shopping, we take them for walks, we uh, integrate mental health and social work into the model, we give them rides through partnerships with people like Uber and Lyft, we uh, co-manage tightly with a small group of hospitalists and specialists, we pick on according to data. Right? None of which I just said is news to anyone. I think we just simply stop making excuses and we just do it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, we've had to build our own IT platform. Uh, unfortunately, all the electronic health records out there were built to document and code and bill hire. They're transactional systems. We had to build our, our own, which was uh, relational. We call it a collaborative care platform. 
Um, you know, but I'm not going to talk about any of that because I think you know all that, right? We all know the right thing to do. I think the hard part is figuring out how to do it, right? And how do we lead? How do we lead this transformation of healthcare from whatever uh, vantage point we're in? And to me, the, the hard part isn't, again, we focus a lot on business models, but we know what they ought to be. We focus a lot on process. I think we know what they ought to be. We focus a lot on technology. To me, the thing that really matters, and which I've learned over 15 years, is, is about culture, right? If we get the culture right, all the other stuff will follow. If we get the culture wrong, no matter how much structure and process and technology we put in, it's going to fail, right? What's interesting is I think a lot of other industries have figured this out before us. Think uh, Southwest Airlines, Disney, Zappos, right? They know that the way you build great companies, the way you change industries, is you fundamentally change culture, right? What's different from Southwest versus United? It's the culture, right? Certainly when they got started, right? So I think that's what we need to focus on. So our goal has been to try and transform healthcare at scale, right? And we're tiny. We have 24 practices across the country. Uh, they work, by the way. So, you know, we generate great outcomes and we lower our hospitalizations by 40% and we lower costs by 15% and docs and patients like it. Um, but, but despite these great results, or maybe because of it, um, the journey has not been easy over 15 years. Um, and again, the hard part, I think, is getting the culture right. So we had the fortune early on uh, at Iora to have Tony Shea, the CEO of Zappos, be an early investor and a, uh, serve on our board. And Tony taught me early on that the thing that underlies culture are actually values. And that what we ought to do early on is become really clear what are the values we stand for and that that would build culture and that would let us build process and that would let us build technology and that'll get the business model right and then we will transform the industry. So, uh, so we got a group of us together. They were a small but mighty group of us, as we called ourselves, uh, about 15 of us, and really talked about what are the values that we thought would undergird transforming healthcare. Uh, and we came up with five of them. And what I wanted to do today is just talk about the values that we picked. Uh, so by the way, th this is not that everyone ought to copy these values, but it's an example of, I think, the sort of transformation and sort of deep value change we need in order to build the right culture. And by the way, we decided not to write them down on a piece of paper or on a website. What we did is we created these little values cubes. Uh, if any of you have been to our practice uh, over in Hanover, they sit in all of our practices, they sit on everyone's desk at our main office, even our programmers have it, and not on it, we have our five values, and uh, it's a nice soft little cube, and why? So uh, it's a reminder everywhere what the values are, but also if you see someone not uh, fulfilling your values, you could throw it at them. And uh, it's uh, hard enough that you feel it, but it's um, not hard enough to draw blood, I hope. So, um, so let me talk about them. So the first, the, first, uh, the first of them here is feel empathy. Feel empathy. There's a lot of noise and uh, a lot of potential conflicting goals when you try to transform healthcare. And often, I think as all of you know, when you try to do this, often the right answer is hard and different people's interests at stake. And I found the key to cut through all of this is very simple, is that we just need to do what's right for our patients and there's a period at the end of that sentence. Right, the goal of, so when I was, uh, Prior to doing Iora, I ran this interfaculty health policy program at Harvard. And we were going to transform healthcare by pulling together a group of all the stakeholders. So we had, you know, represented from the AMA and from the American Hospital Association and the American Association of Health Plans and then the drug company and then the brokers and the employers. And somehow getting them in a room would fix healthcare. And, and this, it became really clear to me very quickly this was an absolute waste of time, right? Because guess who created the current system is that group of people. Right? And the only people who are not at the table were the only people who mattered, which are the people we serve. Right? Every other business in the world has figured out the goal of our business is to serve our customers, period. And I think we forget that too often in healthcare. Right? So we need to serve our patients, period. Um, but in order to do that, I think we need to understand what they're going through. Uh, so. Yeah, one of my favorite stories, and apologies if you've heard this before, but of, of the hundreds and thousands of, tens of thousands of patients we've taken care of, this one sticks with me the most. And she was a patient in one of our earliest practices in Atlantic City, New Jersey. 
And I was the doc there, and the health coach, who was, uh, had seen her, she had just come in for her first visit, came in and she said, Doc, there's a new patient here, and she's a hot mess. I was like, really? So I walk in the room, and she was. She had sort of her hair was disheveled. She had this sort of blank look in her eyes. Her, um, she was, I looked at her chart. She had been in and out of the emergency room. She was not taking her medicine. She was in and out of work. Her blood pressure was out of control. Her A1C was 13 and a half. And so we met. We started talking. We introduced her to our health coach. She started um, coming to some of our groups. Um, I ended up leaving that practice. I was trying to figure out how do we scale this? How do we build a second one? So I came back to Atlantic City six months later, and the doc who took over for me, Neil Patel, he said, Rashika, remember that lady we saw early on, uh, Joyce, who we said was such a hot mess? I was like, yeah. Like, She's back. I want you to see her. I was like, sure. So I walk in the room, and she looks like a different person. Her hair is combed, a little makeup on, glint in her eye. Uh, I look at her chart, no ER visits, back to work, taking her meds. Blood pressure was under control. A1C had dropped to seven and a half. And I was like, wow, Joyce, you look amazing. And she said, Doc, I've never felt better in my life. And I asked the obvious question. I think, Joyce, please help me. What have we done to make you better? And she said something really profound. She did not say, by the way, you are a great doctor. You follow the guidelines. You have a great IT system. You have a good business model. You have a nice base design. She didn't say any of that. She said something very profound. She said, Doc, you all cared about me. You taught me to care about myself, and I didn't want to let any of us down. You cared about me. You taught me to care about myself. I didn't want to let any of us down. Right? That's the sharp end of the sword. That's what we're forgetting in healthcare with all this mishigas that we throw onto it. That's the piedra, right? that we need to chip stuff away. And that's about empathy. Right? That's empathy. I think you said someone talks about love. That's what it is. Right? That's what we need to do. So number one is uh, to feel empathy. I think if we don't feel empathy, we have no chance at transforming healthcare. So second is uh, bring creativity. Right? There's a great quote from uh, Albert Einstein. He said that the problems we have cannot be solved with the same level of thinking that created them. Right? And I think too often we're trying to solve the problems of healthcare using the same old techniques and the same old rules and the same old structures, and uh, that's probably the definition of insanity. Right? So um, in general, we have to be willing to think out of the box and way out of the box. And too much of the healthcare system is focused, I think, on narrow things we get paid for, and you need to be really creative. So let me give an example about a patient here in Hanover. Right? So, um, she was a young woman, she was new to town, she hadn't made many friends, uh, and she had ended up with a bad GI bug, and ended up throwing up and becoming hypotensive, and ended up going to the hospital, getting admitted to Dartmouth-Hitchcock. And so, you know, we tracked her, and then um, she was getting discharged on a Friday. And as you know, these days, the pressure to get people out of hospitals quickly, when you're getting discharged from the hospital, you're not better, you're just better enough to not be in the hospital. So she ended up at home, and what we tend to do is we go and do a home visit, uh, often with our patients just to make sure they're okay. So we sent one of our nurses, Robin, and a health coach uh, to go visit her in her home. And so the nurse was sitting there and the nurse did her thing, took the blood pressure, uh, but the health coach asked the right question. It says, empathy, how are you doing? Um, are you feeling okay? And she said, you know, I, I'm feeling sort of weak. Uh, I'm glad I'm out of the hospital, but I don't feel the strength to go and cook myself some food. I don't know what I'm going to do over the weekend. As a health coach, who had been a personal chef, by the way, in her prior life, uh, said, do you mind if I go in your kitchen and whip something up? She said, absolutely. So she went in, made her, while the, while the nurse was taking care of her, made a big pot of chicken soup, made a big pot of pasta for her, right? Now, it was exactly the right thing to do. We probably saved a readmission, right, by doing that. Why does no one do that? No one, people think their job is do what the protocol says. There's no protocol for making chicken soup and pasta for a lady who doesn't have friends who just got, you know, you, we're not smart enough to create these protocols, right? We have to have empathetic people and then let them use their creativity to actually fix the problem for individual people. One of my other favorite quotes is from uh, Anna Karenina, the first line, happy families are happy in their own way, unhappy families are unhappy in their own way, right? So that's the key, it's unhappy people, sick people, you can't protocolize, and we need to have that. So show creativity. And by the way, as a leader, our job is not just to be creative ourselves. Our job is to create environments where the people who work for us 
actually can be creative, right? We need to give that license, and I think that's really important. So third, uh, act with passion. Leading through disruption is really hard. All of you I'm, no, I'm sure who are doing it know. Uh, they're hard on the leaders, and they're hard on the team. If we think we come in every day to simply punch the clock and do our job, uh, we will never succeed. Uh, so we need to ourselves, and I think for our teams, connect to passion. Again, Tony Shea did this unbelievably well at Zappos. I don't know if you have, any of you have been to Las Vegas and taken the Zappos tour. It is unbelievable. This is a company that, that sells shoes on the internet, and people are unbelievably passionate about their work, and they show it, right? They're creative, they're passionate, uh, they think they're doing something amazing, and they are, right? Um, if they can do that with shoes, imagine what we can do in healthcare. Uh, too often, I think, our healthcare institutions are incredibly glum places. You walk in and it's awful. It feels like, you know, something awful has just happened, right? So I think we need to connect with passion. So, so, so in one of our practices, for instance, um, one of our health coaches, uh, Jeanette, was a cheerleader in high school. And she decided this is, yeah, that uh, she was going to celebrate when our patients did something well. So she brought her old pom-poms in. And uh, whenever a patient has a, what we call a small victory, whether they quit smoking, they drop their A1C, they control their blood pressure, uh, anything at all, um, the whole team gets called into the room, she brings her pom-poms, and they do a cheer. Uh, and patients absolutely love it. Uh, they created a board, and then they take a picture of the patient with their health coach in the dock, and they post it up on this big bulletin board, you know, obviously with their permission, uh, about their victory. And, and by the way, we way overdo HIPAA, Patients absolutely love having these victories posted up on the board with them and their health coach, right? And it sets up a whole different passion about we're actually changing people's lives and let's create these small reminders along the way, right? So I think consciously create passion. So fourth, demonstrate courage, right? Um, leading through disruption is really hard uh, and not everyone will want you to succeed. Uh, I actually argue that if no one's getting upset at you, you aren't really disrupting, and you're actually not changing. And by the way, if you're not changing, the world's gonna squash you, right? In a time of disruption, you either are a disruptor or you're disrupted, you're one or the other. <laughs> so you can decide. But in order to be a disruptor, you have to have courage. Uh, this is not easy, and we face this all the time. We've had health plans uh, kick us out of their network. Uh, we have had health systems uh, cut us out. We have been accused of raising expectations for making other practices look bad, <laughs> for upsetting the status quo. We've had cease and desist letters sent to us for stealing people's patients, which means they vote with their feet, by the way, and come to us. Uh, you know, and I think in the long run, you just have to decide that you're going to do this, and the goal isn't to make friends. The goal is to do the right thing for our patients and let the chips fall where they may. So. And then finally, uh, number five, serve with humility. This is not a common value in healthcare, uh, particularly among doctors. We all know who we are. Um, <laughs> I think there's probably a class in, class in medical school has something to do with the, the opposite of humility. Um, but we're entering into a new world. And I think if we think we know all the answers, we are simply fooling ourselves, right? Um, I believe the key to the new world we're entering into are to get the power dynamics right. And I think the power dynamics of top-down command and control is utterly incompatible with trying to create this new world we're trying to create. Um, we went, uh, early on, I had the fortune of uh, getting a small grant from the Robert Johnson Foundation when we were trying to figure out how to create these new models and got to spend time with this amazing practice in uh, Santa Ana, California called Latino Health Access. And this amazing woman, America Bracco, who ran it, who was a doc who came from South America and decided, by the way, that the way she's gonna impact the health of the community is not to be a doctor, but actually to build a community health worker model. Uh, and she had this amazing model, but she had an org chart posted on the wall, which was a flipped pyramid. She said, the people in charge are our patients. That's who we work for. And then serving the patients 
are these community health workers who are close to the patients. The job of us as doctors and nurses and, and trained clinicians are to serve these community health workers. And the job of those of us running organizations is to serve everyone above us. Right? It's a very different way to look at the world, but it's exactly the right thing. And why is it? Because all the good ideas of how we're going to disrupt healthcare will not come from us in this room. Right? We are all too far from the experiences of the people we serve. The best job we can do is create an environment, again, where we let people have the power to try things. So um, the two stories I'll share here. Um, one is, uh, in all of our practices, we run groups, right? Groups are great ways to get patients to interact with each other. And one of the groups we run in almost every one of our practices is yoga. Right, yoga is great for musculoskeletal problems. It's great for people with depression. Uh, and so we run yoga classes. They're usually full and they do great. We opened a practice about five years ago for the Carpenters Union in Massachusetts. So we offered a yoga class for the Carpenters. And no one showed up. And so one of our health coaches, Mike Judy, of course, asked the Carpenters, um, why aren't you coming to yoga? And they say, yoga is for sissies and tights. <laughs> We are carpenters. Uh, so Mike had this great idea. He went to Home Depot and bought a bunch of heavy hammers. And he said, next week, we're going to have hammer time. Now, hammer time is yoga with hammers in your hand. <laughs> but hammer time is cool. So we now have really full hammer time classes for the carpenters because hammer time is cool. Right? So um, similar. Uh, to use our practice here in Hanover. Uh, we, uh, you know, we track data on how we're doing, and one of the things we track, because this is the heatest measure, is pap smear rates. And so early on in our practice here in Hanover, uh, we noticed that the pap smear rate was actually pretty low. Actually, we didn't notice. Uh, the, doc, the docs in Hanover, we compare all our practices. They say, why are we lower than everyone else? So Laura Duncan, some of you may know, is a doc, one of our docs here. Uh, she... Um, she said, I want to do something about this. So Laura uh, had a little focus group of her. We do these patient advisory dinners. So she asked the patients, uh, why are you not coming in for pap smears? And the obvious answer is, because the experience sucks, doctor. We don't look forward to it. She said, well, I'll fix that. So she created Pappy Hour. <laughs> <laughs> and so on the uh, first Monday of most months, uh, the, at 5 p.m., the male docs and health coaches, they go away, and then the, um, they have the women stay, and they have wine and cheese and crackers and some music, and the women come, and they do whatever women do when us guys are not in the room, uh, and one by one, they go in the back, and there's a candle and a mint on the pillow and some soft music going, and they have their pap smear, and they go back to some more wine and cheese. And um, the pap smear rate... The pap smear rate, by the way, went through the roof. <laughs> right? I would never have come up with Pappy Hour <laughs> or been able to pull this off. Right? But, but it was exactly the right thing to do for the community. Right? So again, I think to me, this serving with humility, uh, understanding we don't know the answer, but we'll... By the way, the key to both of these stories, the key is actually not Laura Duncan. The key was asking the patients, right? This is the key, is asking the patients. It is <laughs> such an obvious thing to do, and we don't do it often enough. You know, and they'll, they'll tell you, and it's often obvious, and then you can figure out the, the fix. So, um, so these are our five values, right? Feel empathy, bring creativity, act with passion, demonstrate courage, and serve with humility. Uh, these are easy to say. They're really, really hard to do. Um, I think, however, what my experience is over 15 years is this is the basis. This sort of thing is the basis of how we transform healthcare. Again, if we get these sorts of values right, we build the right culture, that will evolve the right, plat the right sort of processes. We will then build and pick the right technology. We'll figure out the right business models, and that will transform care, and that's how we lead it. So we, we live in interesting times, right? I think uh, that's, that's the blessing and the curse that we all have, all have. And we are in a privileged but hard position of leading change you know, from the variety of perspectives that we all live in this room. And I think while it's important to focus on the other stuff, uh, we just need to focus on get the values right and hope people don't throw cubes like this at us too often. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>